Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show hosted by a French professor who thinks a lot about music and a lot about movies, which is why I'm happy to talk about the new album by Sufjan Stevens and Angela D'Augustine, A Beginner's Mind. Now, I'm going to get to the movie part. I think we could also think of this album as something of a COVID album. You know, there's going to be a lot of this music coming out over the next couple of years. You get the feeling this is made by two artists who like hanging around with each other, who made a very intimate album with a sort of limited uh, instrumental palette, limited uh, development of their songs. Just two friends making music that's mostly based on just sitting around and watching movies. The fact that it's two people who are very clearly good collaborators and feel like friends also adds another element to this album. Not a lot of albums that are COVID themed, I think would use this, this adjective, but I think this album's very cute, you know? Like, I sort of had the image of like John C. Riley and Will Ferrell in, in Step Brothers, you know? Like, oh, are we gonna make an album? Yeah, are we gonna talk about all these movies? Oh yeah, that's gonna be the greatest thing. So much room for activities. And like just getting together and like making this album. And, and if you read the credits, you know, every single instrument has both of their names listed as playing that instrument on each song. It's a very nice sort of collective song, I mean, collective album. And it has really the feeling of, of a COVID album where there's people together in COVID. And in that way, I think maybe it shows a different collaborative spirit. And even though it has been a time of isolation, it's also been a time of great collaboration and closeness of people you care about. So I don't know. I think you could see this album in that context. But obviously, this is not about that. This album is not about COVID. It is a concept album. Now, I don't know that much about Sufjan Stevens. I've reviewed a couple of his things, but for the most part, during his rise to fame, I wasn't paying attention to music. Um, it does seem like he's done a fair amount, based on what I've read, of concept albums. And I remember when I was in high school, I asked my brother Ward, I asked him about, like, about concept albums. And he said that they're great, except that often when artists start making concept albums, they can't stop. And he gave us an example of The Who, and he gave us an example of Pink Floyd. And I think that's an interesting idea, and I think it's true. Both of those bands are capable of doing what a great concept album can do, which is it can work as a concept, and it can work outside of the concept, right? So that's why I would say maybe Quadrophenia is far superior to Tommy, because you take Tommy out of the concept, out of the whole story, a lot of the songs don't hold up. Whereas Quadrophenia, you don't need to know the story to know each of the songs. So the question is, how does this album hold up with its larger concept? Now the funny thing is, I started listening to this album without knowing what the concept even was, okay? It was, you know, New Music Friday, and I was listening, and I knew that I liked Sufjan Stevens, and I saw this image of the cover, okay? I saw this image of the cover, and I'm going to be completely honest with you, I saw this and went, oh my god, that looks just like that movie uh, Clash of the Titans. Oh, I loved that movie when I was a kid. That's weird. And then I saw the title, A Beginner's Mind, and I was like, all right, it's gonna be one of these faux Eastern, like super earnest, spiritual quest style albums. You know, I was thinking of the, the Ascension, his album from last year, which had a lot of that kind of messianic searching things. And so I thought it might be in that vein. Imagine my delight when I learned that the reason that looks like it is from The Clash of the Titans is because that is actually the theme of the album. These two artists have decided to take 13, 14 different songs and write each of them based around a movie that they like and that they appreciate. Now, funny thing about that image too, I saw it in other images from this, uh, from this album and thought, you know, that actually reminds me, you know, because I, I, I also collect Star Wars memorabilia and people have been, uh, commissioning artists in Africa, in particular in Ghana, to make Star Wars posters in a kind of a different um, African style, kind of an outsider art style. And I thought, you know, this kind of reminds me of that. Oh well. It turns out that that cover and the other art was made by Ghanaian interpreters, right? And I think that's intentional and on purpose. I think it reflects a lot of the idea of the album, you know? When we have a movie based on a song, I mean, a song based on a movie, Movies based on songs is a whole nother genre. <laughs> Can't buy me love. Um, when you have songs based on movies, it's a very enticing concept, right? On the one hand, it is the very definition of postmodern, right? In particular, that area of uh, the pillar of postmodernity known as intertextuality, as popularized 
or as defined by Julia Kristeva, the Bulgarian-born French intellectual, who described intertextuality as any work of art that references another work of art, right? So in, in this very idea of making a song, as an example, a song about Clash of the Titans, or a song about Wings of Desire, we'll get to all the songs later, it's a very dangerous concept, I think, to execute well. Because in order to do intertextuality well, you have to do two separate things. You have to give and you have to take. The taking is the easy part, taking inspiration from the source material. But for it to be really good, you actually have to give a new perspective on that source material, okay? Like, add something to it. You're not just making a reference, but you may be recontextualizing it, making you think about it in a different way, right? I mean, even something as simple and goofy as one of the earliest examples of intertextuality in modern cinema, the movie Clerks, when they're talking about Star Wars, yeah, they're just taking references from Star Wars, but then they also give back this kind of working man's uh, basement filled with nerds talking about Star Wars perspective, right? Like, there is a give and take in any good intertextuality. And so that's really the question about this concept album, right? Like, like that's the, the, the test for this whole project, okay? Is it a good concept to take these songs and write about, you know, take these movies and write songs about them, right? I'm gonna keep making that mistake between songs and movies. I don't edit, so you're just gonna have to bear with it, okay? If I edited, I wouldn't release three to four episodes a week. So you, you get it warts and all, or in this case, unshaved mustache and all. I need to take care of that. I'm looking like a prospector. <laughs> uh, you know, like, um, whether or not this concept works really depends on how well they have this give and take with the source material. And can they make something interesting and personal? Or is it just going to be a gimmick? A cute and funny idea, you know? And as we'll see, as I'm going to make the determination, you know, I only do positive reviews, so obviously my, my take is going to be yes, they do. But how they do it is quite interesting. Stay tuned to the very end if you want to hear me talk about my own personal history with writing songs about movies. When I was a musician, when I wrote songs, that was the primary way that I wrote songs. So I'll show you that history at the end. But let's get into the album, okay? Let's get into the album and with a stamp, with my homework, okay? My example song. If you want to know what this album sounds like, feels like, the ambitions of the album, this is the thing, okay? I'll put a link to it up there. All right, this is a song dedicated to John Carpenter's 1982 movie, The Thing, okay? As far as music goes, it's a perfect example of this album, okay? We have a sort of gentle piano, the chords are played on sort of an arpeggio, note by note, a very whispering, high, close voice, very much in your ear, everything clean and well-produced. The chorus has some nice, uh, interesting phrasing where the rhythms of the lines are delivered a little bit differently with a slight addition of a new instrument, a Wurlitzer, I believe, kind of in the back. The chords don't quite change, but the layering changes a little bit. The second verse has this beautiful background voice where the other singer comes in. I don't know Sufjan Stevens or Angelo to Augustine well enough to know which one is singing when. And if that bothers you, you can quit this video and give me a thumbs down. That's fine. I'm just admitting my own ignorance, okay? I don't know his voice well enough to know when it's him singing or when it's the other guy. But I do know when they're both singing. And on this second verse, it's a beautiful example of how these voices interlace, right? Because you have this one voice in the lead and the other voice in the back, like a, like a, a beautiful siren, right? After the second chorus, there's a nice kind of like sharper sound, like a little tiny instrumental detail here. But really, I would say this is mostly a a playground for the lyrics and for the concept of how do we develop the idea of the movie The Thing. The Thing is an awesome movie, okay? <laughs> One thing that I like about this album is that it doesn't just go straight down the center with great movies or movies that are widely accepted to be great. They're interesting movies. It feels a little bit like they are trying to not just do the easiest movies to interpret, but The Thing is ripe for interpretation. Okay? If you haven't seen it, it's a movie about a bunch of people in Antarctica or South Pole, somewhere Arctic, and an alien infects people's bodies and, and kills all the members of the expedition crew one by one, including a dog. 
because the dog dies, I can never watch this movie with my family, which really sucks because I've been trying to teach them about horror movies and uh, we just can't watch that. But you know, in this song, the, the concept of the album is proven to be a good one. A lyric like, this is the thing about people, you never really know what's inside, right? So yes, you don't know if there's an alien living inside, but that adds to the movie because it's this concept of the nature of humanity, like what is humanity, right? That's what this song is really about. What is the nature of humanity? And that is the point of the movie. But the movie isn't gentle, it isn't close, it isn't intimate. It isn't two handsome men sitting in a room playing music together and tickling each other's toes and laughing about the songs, right? Like, it isn't that. It's a big Kurt Russell movie with flamethrowers and ice and all this, right? So it is adding to this, it's sort of, it's highlighting the deeper meaning of the movie. You know, a lot of my, a lot of my friends, this is their favorite movie. And like, it's not because it's about humanity, it's because it's a badass movie about aliens, right? But really, what Sufjan and Angelo do is they bring it out. And they even make it a personal interpretation. Like there are certain lines in this that even though I know the movie, the thing quite well, I don't know what this line means. My love is a witness for the loss of your innocence. I don't know. It's a beautiful line and it feels personal and it feels true. And what he's able to do, what they're able to do, is really process their feelings through this intertextual mode to make something that's cute, funny, and actually I think that cuteness helps it to be too insular, too, too solipsistic, right? Um, and it really does a great job of giving and taking. So if you've heard that song and you like it, congratulations, you love this album. <laughs> the album does not have that much emotional range. It mostly stays right there. It doesn't have that much instrumental range, that much sort of uh, dynamics range. It's all basically right there in that hanging out in a room, the movie just ended, and the two guys you were watching the movie with weirdly just pulled out guitars and started singing a song, <laughs> right? It sort of feels like that. Like the movie ends and they're like, Sky, do you wanna hear a song? the thing about it has that great feeling i'm not going to go through the rest of the album song by song and have a lot of fun with it the first one is called reach out which is based on a movie by vim vendors called wings of desire now it's very nice to see this because this movie is one of the most important movies in my life the video for the song Stay by U2 is directed by Vim Vendors and is based on the fact that movie's in the sequel to Wings of Desire. I saw that video on MTV and my brother said, if you like that video, you should watch the movie it's based on, Wings of Desire by Vim Vendors. I saw that movie and then that's what started my love of German cinema. That's why I rented the rest of his movies, Alice of the Cities, American Friend, King of the Road, all of that. Like I just got absolutely obsessed with Vim Vendors. It's because of that movie I discovered Nick Cave. You know, that's how I discovered a lot of gothic music and interesting music. This whole movie just absolutely exploded my whole world. I even went to East Germany and went to the library where they filmed it and like <laughs> looked over people's shoulders pretending I was an alien and they asked me to, to stop and asked me to get out of Raus, you know? What I think is funny about Wings of Desire, and I don't think this is intentional on the part of Sufjan and them, but it's a weird movie because I turned on the movie. Once I got to know Vim Vendor's cinema better, I thought of Wings of Desire as kind of a sellout movie. And Germans who I've talked to have often said like, yeah, it's a good movie, but it's too on the nose. East Germany, West Germany, it's too easy. You know, it's not his most contemplative, dark, deep study. In a way, it's sort of like the way maybe an American film critic would talk about the movie American Beauty. Like, it's not bad, but it's not as deep as it thinks it is. But still, as a movie about angels that look down on people and look at their lives, again, it's an interesting analysis of what it is to be human, what it is to be spiritual. Musically, this guitar goes and the voices are high and they harmonize, added guitars on the chorus, and all these very mystical lyrics, which again, do that great give and take with the source material. I come from conscience where there is no conjugation. I would rather be a flower than the ocean, okay? Just take a little while. I'm just gonna say that again. I would rather be a flower than the ocean. I would rather be devoured than be broken. I don't quite get it. 
but it works, you know? I think on a certain, to a certain extent, they don't just like take things from the movie and take lines. It's often the feeling that the movie gives you. And so as someone who knows Wings of Desire quite well, this makes perfect sense. Now I can't go, oh, this is the scene after they talk to Peter Falk and this and that, right? Like I can't do that. But it makes emotional sense with the movie. The bridge is almost like a, like a pop verse, just repeating over and over again, reach out to the ones who came before you. There is sort of a weird, slight pop sensibility at times that creeps in in this album. Next song is Lady Macbeth in Chains. A movie, uh, all, all About Eve is the subject of this one. I saw it a long time ago. More of a developed song. It's nice to have a little bit of development here. Some like drums being played with a, with a brush. Um, very catchy pre-chorus, a totally full chorus, and just great bass work. After hearing this song, I've heard the album four or five times, I wish there was more bass work like this all the way throughout. Because the great piano and, and guitar is great, but when it's really bolstered by the bass, like on this song, it's just awesome. Here, they start doing this thing where they actually just say the name of the movie in, in the lyrics. All about Eve, cat up in a tree, Margot Channing, listen to me, don't believe what she says when she sleeps in your head. Um, it gets kind of heady, a little bit, a little bit over intellectualized, where it really talks about the pity and terror. Like it's actually talking about the pathos of theater, as you know, described in, in classical Greek times. Um, but it does a great job of not just embodying a sort of theme of a faded star and the nature of trying to hold on to, hold on to your art, hold on to your relevance, um, but also just makes you want to rewatch the movie, which is another thing this does quite well, where you feel like you want to watch, like I want to go on a movie watching spree, you know? Like I just want to like listen to this album for the next month and just go through and figure out how to get all these movies, probably from my school's library. Back to Oz is based on the movie Return to Oz. Now this is the first movie I'm gonna talk about that I haven't seen. It's kind of infamous as not being great. I figure given their ages, this is probably a nostalgia thing, at least for Sufjan Stevens. Um, but this is probably the best song, you know? cool kind of scratchy electric guitar, like drums and xylophone in the chorus. This is doing the most. Maybe this is a problem with me because I had a problem listening to this album thinking, what the hell am I going to say about this album when it's just two guys whispering about noise for 48 minutes? Like, like I want a little bit more to digest and this is a little bit more full, which doesn't make it better. But to my personal taste, I enjoy it more. It has an like actual guitar solo, actually two guitar solos. I assume they're trading off guitar solos. Um, very catchy, repeating the catchy parts. Next song is The Pillar of Souls, based on Hellraiser 3. I've never seen a single Hellraiser movie. Now, one second. You are already mad at me for not knowing what Sufjan Stevens uh, sound, sounds like. I consider myself to be a horror movie fanatic, and I've never seen a Hellraiser movie. Do you know why? Ew. That dude with the pins in his face, like, I just don't want to see it. I don't, I don't know why. I, I could do Freddy, you know, Sleep Away Camp, and all of it, you know? I spit on your grave, all of it. Last House on the Left, I mean, it can get dark. Hills Have Eyes, the old version and the superior new version. Hit me in the comments. I just can't do the pinhead guy. I just, <laughs> for some reason, it's too gross to me. Um, but again, it's another great song. It's funny that the first, the songs I like the most from the beginning are the two movies I haven't seen. Very high and haunting voice. This just backs up the, this very intimate vocals. It's got chimes and cymbals and synthesizers all over the place. It gets very cool and ominous in the bridge. It has like this percussion sound that's far away. Maybe this does uh, another, another example of emphasizing or, or echoing the feeling of the movie, I assume, in the production of the songs. You Give Death a Bad Name is about Night of the Living Dead. Okay, I am going to quote Spinal Tap and say it's such a fine line between stupid and clever, okay? It's an easy line to quote, all right? Um, but that is the real question with this whole song. It's very much based on the song You Give Love a Bad Name by Bon Jovi. It's like they almost would have to give credit just based on the meter of how they create it. it does it make it? Is it good enough? Stupid, clever, stupid, clever, stupid, clever. It's clever. 
It's not stupid. It actually ends up being quite good because again, it uses these movies and this is what's great about the whole thing. The whole album ends up being a meditation on humanity. That's what the whole thing ends up being. In aggregate, that's what it ends up being. Right, sort of like on humanity and, and reality. And like, how do, we, how do we interact with reality? And can we sort of transcend our reality? That seems to be the basic theme of the whole thing. And what once is dead is now out for you. And just uses a lot of the things from the movie, a lot of themes of the zombies, which was created by George A. Romero, right? The zombies before Romero was a, his, a history of uh, Haitian voodoo, which I'll go into some other time, hopefully. Uh, it's a thing I teach in some of my classes. This is what changed uh, zombies for everyone. And okay, it's not the only song that talks about zombies, right? I mean, Weezer had that great song, Die Zombie Die, whatever that was from a couple of years ago. Um, but it does it in a little bit more of an elevated, a little bit more of a uh, profound way. Beginner's Mind is based on Point Break, a movie which I've seen half of. I'll probably never tell the story as to why I've never seen the second half of it. But uh, it's a movie that is just so much a part of my life. It's funny, I've never watched Dirty Dancing either, yet I know everything about Dirty Dancing, I know everything about Point Break, I've never seen Roadhouse, I know everything about Roadhouse. I don't know what it is about Patrick Swayze movies. I've never seen Ghost, holy cow, have I never seen a Patrick Swayze movie? I don't think I have, but his movies are such a part of my, my youth and of my culture and of the zeitgeist that I know everything about Point Break. Like, I know the names of the characters, I know the plot points, of Johnny Utah and Bodie and all that. Like, you just know it just from growing up, you know? And it's great here, because it has this great sort of like gentle piano here. Um, and, and one thing that's cool is what I remember from the first half of the movie and the way this movie is talked about is that it's a movie that tries to be a little bit more than just a stupid surf movie, just a stupid crime movie by having this character of Bodhi, of having the bank robber be something of a Zen master. And why not, right? Why not think of him as a hero? Why not actually go into the concept and take it seriously? And that's the thing that this, that this album does well. It takes all of its material seriously without winking. I don't think there's winking. Put in the comments if you disagree with me. I don't hear winking. If I heard winking, you know, like, <laughs> I'm gonna be taking <laughs> point break seriously. If I heard winking, I would buy this album on CD, drive in my car, open up the window, and throw it out the window, okay? That's how mad I would be. But this all feels genuine. And that's maybe another gift of the album. Olympus is the song finally about Clash of the Titans. You know, I, I'm a you know I'm a big Star Wars fan, right? I'm a Star Wars collector. You know, I have a ridiculous Chewbacca collection. Um, but the truth of it is, the movie I watched most growing up was Clash of the Titans. I mean, I watched that movie like every day. I mean, I loved that. I had no idea what was going on. You know, like, I, I don't. I just but I just the the Harryhausen effects and just the stories. I absolutely loved it. And it really goes quite nicely here. It's funny because he even mentions there's no place like home. So it seems to be tying together with the themes of Oz. Just a nice stilted, sad guitar line, nice melody. I couldn't quite pick out the lyrics in the song too well. I couldn't exactly figure out what it was saying about Clash of the Titans. Um, but there's another part of this album where the whole thing is in just this flow. The whole album flows so nicely because it stays in that... And that one register doesn't go too high, too low, like super fast song, super slow song, all that. Um, this was really, every time when I'm listening to this album, at this point I'm just riding along on the album. Murder and Crime is based on Mad Max. Uh, I, it's another movie people get mad at me for thinking is okay, but not great. You know, it's okay. I mean, the new Mad Max is great, but the old Mad Max is... I don't know, I've never been a super fan, but still this is, so you know, the most, the thing about all this, and anytime you have a folk singer singing high and with, you know, double voices and right in your ear, it makes you think of Elliot Smith. This is the most Elliot Smith is here, but I really enjoyed the development of the chorus. Then comes, uh, here's the thing. Whoops. I dropped my notes. I'm not gonna edit. I told you I'm not gonna edit. I didn't lie about that. Oh, I forgot to show you my, my disc of Night of the Living Dead. I got all these props. My wife tells me that, that props take away from the videos, that I spend too much time on them and that nobody cares, Sky. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Uh, next up is It's Your Own Body and Mind, based on the movie by Spike Lee, She's Gotta Have It. 
I'm going to tell you something about the movie She's Gotta Have It. I rented it, and it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> it is such an interesting depiction of female sexuality and female sexual empowerment, and I was too young. And it just scared me. Like, that scared me more than, than all the horror movies on this. In the, you know, it scared me more than The Thing uh, or Night of the Living Dead, uh, which I think says a lot about uh, growing up in a fairly repressive sexuality mind, sexual mindset. But I love this song. Very kind of simplistic chord delivery here. But then the chorus, it just breaks out and becomes almost like a Beach Boys chorus. We're just singing the title of the movie, She's Gotta Have It. Just soaring voices in the chorus. And this does the what this album, when I think it's at its best, is when it's between something minimal and something lush, right? It's never maximal, but at times it feels lush. And this song in particular feels lush. Lost in the World is based on the movie The Last Wave. And this is one I'm embarrassed to say I'd never even heard of. Now, I like Peter Weir, the director, okay? Uh, what was that great movie he did with... Uh, Jeff Bridges. He did this great movie with Jeff Bridges where he, he survives an airplane crash. He was just amazing. Okay, that's, that's gonna bug me if that's the video. Anyways, I like Peter Weir as a director. I didn't see this movie. Um, and I do think that maybe takes away from the song in this case. You know, like beautiful harmony on here, but maybe just because I didn't feel like I knew the atmosphere. And this is the danger of and the beauty of intertextuality is if you're expecting to know to feel it, right? If you tell me this song is based on She's Gotta Have It, like, I've got, the, I've got the image of she, cause she, she's got to have it. I've got all the things that are happening. When you're telling me it's based on Night of Living Dead, I'm thinking it. When you're telling me Point Break, I'm picturing Keanu Reeves with the water just dripping off his beautiful face, right? Like, I picture all those things, right? But, like, when I don't know, and I'm expecting to, there's kind of a void there. Fictional California is based on Bring It On Again. I think this is their most kind of brave sort of like, can you believe we're talking about this movie? <laughs> but it really works. Um, I, I really enjoyed this nice kind of catchy melody, especially in the chorus with these descending high bells going along. Um, it seems to be about this, you know, this movie, which is about cheerleaders. When I lived in Santa Barbara, it's true, my house, there was a cheerleading summer camp in my backyard, like in my backyard, like, a hundred feet from my window, there was a, a cheerleading summer camp. And it was very weird. It was like being next to some kind of like military parade grounds. Because <laughs> people were just like, it wasn't like funny or cute or anything. It was just like all summer, all summer, just screaming, just people screaming through megaphones. And so what I like about this, again, it's this intertextual thing where we're sort of taking heart, we're taking pity on the people in this situation, all alone at the megaphone, look alive but feel dead inside. Going back again to this theme of humanity, of life and death, and sort of transcending where you are in your life. Which in that way, come to think of it, I guess it actually works pretty well with Ascension, Sufjan Stevens' last album as well. Um, I just don't know Sufjan Stevens well enough to honestly say that this fits perfectly within his catalog because I don't know his music beyond those, these last two albums. But it seems like it's pretty well connected there, right? This, this sense of ascension, the sense of transcendence, of overcoming, if not death, at least overcoming the banality of life. And I love the concept of fictional California, right? Like, it's one, like having lived in California, it's weird because you live in a place that has been so fictionalized that while you live there, you feel like you're in a fictional representation of the place that you're in. You know, like you're walking down, I don't know, Vermont Avenue in, in Los Angeles and you see the, the palm trees and you have like a Jamba Juice and you're just like, is somebody behind me with a camera? Am I? Like, you just have that feeling. Sumerian Shade is based on Silence of the Lambs. This is the Criterion Edition. This is worth a lot, a lot of money. I don't know why I said that like a Trump impersonation. Worth a lot of money. Um, a great idea though here, because if you're gonna have a song about Silence of the Lambs, there's a lot of different ways you could do it that aren't that particularly interesting. This one, it gives you sympathy for Buffalo Bill. And it's Buffalo Bill talking directly to the director, Jonathan Demme, who, side note, was a great collector of Haitian art. It's true. Before he died, he had a great collection of Haitian art because of the movie Serpent and the Rainbow. That was the movie they made. Yeah, uh, that he made that was partially based on Haitian voodoo going back to zombies, interestingly enough. 
But I love this idea of the character talking to the director. You know, again, it's about transcending your existence. What is the nature of humanity? Can we have sympathy for Buffalo Bill? Buffalo Bill and Silence of the Lambs in the, uh, in the era that we live in now, in which we have sympathy, in which trans rights are very real and important. You know, uh, Silence of the Lambs was a movie that I never had any problem with and could watch with very little problem. And then over time, like, hmm, and over time, and hmm. And then now the last time I watched it, I'm like, eeeh. And this is super transphobic. This is just not the reality for people. What kind of horrible demonizing is this? This is really going to set us back, you know? So I do think it's interesting that, that Buffalo Bill does sort of require more sympathy. And then for the last song, I did something interesting. I didn't look up what it's based on. I had no idea. This might be a movie that I know. It might be a movie that I don't know. Lacrimai. It's about crying. I don't know. Is it about the crying game? Maybe. I don't, I don't know. Um, but this was great because it gave me a chance just to purely experience the music without thinking of a movie at all. Not a movie I'd seen, a movie I hadn't seen, just to have the pure experience of the music. How does it exist without it, right? How does Tommy exist without the story of Tommy? How does Quadrophenia exist without the story of Quadro? I forget the name of the protagonist in Quadrophenia. You know, like how do they exist and here it just works beautifully. This helped me to understand that the strength of this album, just so gentle and sweet and expands in the chorus, just ethereal, just, uh, uh, the whole thing just feels so ethereal with this great, beautiful harmonizing all the way throughout. So is it a good concept? I would say it is. Is it well executed? I would say that it is. Now, before I talk about my Patreons, I did say I would, I would talk about my history. Eventually I'm gonna release all my old music. I made a lot of music in my early 20s and I never released any of it. And I'm starting to release it on Bandcamp, Bandcamp backslash Professor Sky. But this one's coming out of uh, next year, let's say. It's called TV in the Headrest. And, and what I did was I made instrumentals and then I put movie clips from all these movies into it. And what happens is, is that each of the songs was an autobiography, okay? So I had a song like Key Largo and the way that I picked the quotes, it ended up being a meditation on my father, okay? Fight Club, I took everything just about the relationship with Margot, and that had a lot to do with my, my relationship with my then girlfriend, right? Uh, the song Contempt ended up being another meditation on my father. Cabin Boy ended up being a song all about the way that I see myself, right? And the reason that I bring this up is that this is what I was trying to do is what I think they're trying to do as well. You know, like using these movies to get to deeper truths, not just about the movies, but about themselves. Okay, so these are my Patreons and it's the beginning of October, so I'm gonna be buying music. And all the money that all these people gave me is going to go to buying music. I'm not sure what I'm going to buy. I know what I want to buy, but I can't always find everything that I want. So we're going to see. I'm going to go to the Record Archive in Rochester, New York. I'm going to order through Bandcamp and we'll see. So if you want to support me, you can. You can be like these people as I try to fit all their names onto a piece of paper. I might need a new piece of paper, huh? So thank you very much to all my Patreons for your support. And uh, I'm going to go um, take part in a, a rally in my hometown to try to fight a lot of really terrible racist stuff that's been happening. Okay, that got real. There's the camera.